But again, with this church out here telling people they don't have to do nothing to be saved, it's, it's not doing themselves any good. It's not doing themselves any good when somebody thinks they don't have to worry about anything. It doesn't make sense because why would why would God want obedience from us if at the end of the day I went around telling everybody didn't make it didn't make no difference how I live my life I can make it into the kingdom all I have to do is believe or whatever but that don't make sense this stuff does I mean you really do want to make sure that you do have a relationship with God enough to the point where you have the Holy Spirit I mean what I'm saying by that is if you think you have a if you think you have a, 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 just look at it this way if Billy Graham was right and 90% isn't, isn't good enough that God wants your all then then you can expect that that's exactly what you're gonna get from the Bible and I know that's what you get Obedience pleases God. I'm going to read this. In Scripture, the person who is willing, submits to the Lord, receives stunning blessing of walking more closely with Him. Abraham was called God's friend because he believed God, James 2.23, and that belief was demonstrated through repeated obedience. So if he had never practiced no obedience then he would have never been a believer. I mean, reverse it. All you had to do is reverse the scripture. Reverse it. Scripture says Noah, Enoch, and Levi, Levi all walked with God while mentioning their righteousness. That's right. Because they had the ability to do this. While other people were out in la-la land, while other people were out in la-la land, they were capable of living to God's standards. Honestly, it's easy to lose heart when I hear about the saints like these because I can't seem to get through 60 seconds without disobeying God in one way or another. But let's not read perfection into the lives of these men or any of the other people in Scripture who pleased God through their obedience. We're never told they were perfect. On the contrary, the Word shows us how far they were from it. But they walked with God in a steady relational atmosphere of obedience coupled with repentance. Not only were their acts of obedience pleasing to him, but their posture of regular repentance for disobedience revealed a submission to God's commands. This cadence of obedience and repentance marks the rhythm of walking with God day by day for us too. Yeah, you and I. It's exactly what it takes to be saved. Obedience demonstrates belief. As Christians, we can come away from our study of Scripture, our fellowship with the brethren, our worship in the church, and our private prayer time feeling spiritually strong but when the heat is turned up through difficult circumstances we will choose to demonstrate with our words attitudes and bodies what we believe in our hearts especially when it costs us something well i i, I really i really really disagree with that because like i said i've known people out here I've known people out here that uh, they didn't go out of their way to do things. And Christians, supposed Christians today, they don't have to go out of their way to do things that they're not supposed to be doing. 
how much better would our life be if we had our life under control that way? I mean, it's a little different than me driving down the road pissed off every day. But I did that to myself. Could you imagine where I would be? Now, what what do you think in your daily life that you could possibly do? Before I keep on reading here, what do you think that you could possibly do to have yourself under control in your daily walk out here? What kind of things can you have under control? Cussing. All the lust out here. I mean, I, I'm thinking that there's a whole bunch of things that people can have themselves under control. Do you have a bad thought? Do you think you're going to go to hell for your thoughts? You can go to hell for your thoughts. But let me ask you, are you letting your thoughts get out of control? I know I am. So, it, it, can you have yourself under control? You can. But a lot of it is don't put yourself in that position. <clears throat> I guarantee you I've known people in my life that would have avoided all kinds of things. If not all that they could. To be walking an upright life. And. It all depends on what you're doing every day out here that puts you in a position. I don't even want to talk about myself. Uh, obedience is hard proof of belief. Look at that. So how can you be a believer without obedience? Obedience is the hard proof of belief. To God, to others, and to ourselves. That we can take our father at his word and we are willing to stake our lives on it. There's the word willing. In Luke 6, 46 through 49, Jesus tells us those who don't put his words into practice, but instead live on their own terms can expect devastating effects from the storms of life. Well, I can understand. That's the reason why you're supposed to live according to the Word of God. Because this is supposed to be applied to our lives. Well, I can tell you right now, if somebody professed to be born again, and they're out there living a life of unrepentant sin, then they are not applying the Bible to their life. But... When we live in obedience to him, we build our lives on a firm foundation. So when the storms come, we won't be shaken. Even the smallest acts of obedience today lay a foundation that will help us stand firm in the future. I don't think people realize how much. I mean, I know there are some people out here that realize how important it is to live an obedient life. Don't live an obedient life. Don't expect something good in the end. Believe me. And see, I don't care at the end of the day if obedience is works. Without works, your faith is dead. And I know it. And there's no use in arguing about it. You can talk your faith all day long. In the first place, you're never saved by faith anyway. I don't care if you're supposed to have faith. You're saved by grace. It's the work of God that saves us. Matter of fact, probably the only reason why that you can even be like the Bible says is because of the work of the Holy Spirit in someone in their daily walk out here. Once they've turned to Christ and given God their all, then this can happen. And that's probably the reason why the Christian world out there has not given God their all and the reason why they're not witnessing full uh, restoration, whatever, not restoration, but whatever kind of word you want to use that has them on the straight and narrow. Because I already said, at the end of the day, 
God means business about this. There ain't no if, ands, or buts about it. Nobody's going to be able to jump in line, hide behind somebody. They're not going to be able to get around this stuff. Nobody is going to keep the Holy Spirit out here doing what they want to do. And if you're living that life, you're not going to have the Holy Spirit. Oh, really? Haven't I said how hard it is to be obedient? I mean, to surrender? I mean, to be Christ-like? Yeah. Obedience to God is rarely easy and even less often popular. Less often popular. I'll likely never meet a kid named Obedience. Although he could go by Obed for short. But as a means of showing our Father we trust him and are willing to do what he says, willing, 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 even when it's difficult, there really is nothing better. So as a Christian who together make up the body of Christ, Let's talk about obedience. Pleasing God should please us too. Is that all? Well, I'm going to say it again. A true believer is an obedient person. And it's tied with faith. See? Where the church has distorted this message is, again, if I were to say that you had to do something to be saved, just like the Bible does, then why should I get, why should I have people out here telling me that I'm doing something wrong, either in my walk or by telling other people? I mean, I, like I said, this works-based salvation message out here or whatever people are trying to get from the Bible thinking it's referring back to the law and stuff like that. This, this, this is what God wanted from day one from Adam and Eve. It's the same message he wants in day, what is it? July 6th, 2024. It's the same message. We acknowledge him. We live the life he asked, and he can't deny. I'm going to read this again, and I think this is something else that I read. I I I start. I was recording a video a minute ago, and then all of a sudden. I knew I was already out of space. I couldn't believe I, I made an 11-minute video, and then all of a sudden I got cut off. According to the Bible, obedience is a central part of the Christian faith and comes from believing the gospel. In the Bible, obedience is described as an act of love and faith and is linked to the following, linked to following Jesus. So, I don't know how anybody can follow Jesus unless they're living an obedient life. That's what this is saying. Obedience is love. And first, in John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commandments. 
In John 21, 15 through 19, Jesus tells Peter, if you love me, you will feed my sheep. Obedience as faith. In Romans 1, 5, Paul says, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. In the New Covenant Baptist Church, saving faith is described as an act of obedience to the gospel command to believe in Jesus Christ. Well, it's more than just believing in Jesus Christ because that believing is, I'm telling you, it's a bigger message of the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. There is a bigger message there being preached that Paul is giving. And it's the same message that you could probably even get from Christ in his message because, I mean, the, the, uh, it doesn't make sense to narrow it down to something and then sit here, like I said earlier, if, 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 if somebody came up to me and said, all you have to do is believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, well, then why do I need the Holy Spirit? Why did Jesus tell me and tell you that we needed to be born again, born of water or whatever, and have the Holy Spirit? What would be the purpose of that? That means somebody's missing something. That it's a bigger message than what people are missing. Obedience as submission. From biblical perspective, obedience is more than just compliance. It also submitting to God's authority. This concept comes from the Hebrew word sh shema, which means to hear and respond with, that, with action. There's your gospel. I already knew it. I've already sit here and said the same thing before. Not this right here. This concept comes from the word, the Hebrew word Shema, which means to hear and respond with action. That's the gospel. You pick up the Bible, you live according to the word, there you go. Oh wait, okay. But I don't even know why you're trying to speak for God, got questions, because you're a hypocrite website. What does the Bible say about, about obe obedience? Like I said, I don't know why got questions is on here because they don't know they don't know the truth. They don't. The Bible has much to say about obedience. In fact, obedience is the essential part of the Christian faith. Jesus himself was obedient unto death, even death on the cross. When Christians, the act of taking up our cross and following him, following Christ, means obedience. Well, yeah, because Jesus pointed it out. So if you're telling me that I'm supposed to take up my cross and follow him. Well, we know that I can't be his disciple if I don't deny self. So that means I got to deny self to be able to pick up my cross and follow him. It means obedience. That's what it says. For Christians, the act of taking up our cross and following Christ means obedience. The Bible says that we show our love for Jesus by obeying him in all things. Well, I'm not going to sit here and read that. If you let me keep my commandments, there's two commandments. Love God, love people. Then you look at the rest of the Bible and you can find other things in there that's proof. A Christian who is not obeying Christ's commands can right, can't rightly be asked, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what, do what I say? So there you go. I mean, even this hypocrite website right here, this hypocrite website got questions. Even this hypocrite website got questions, says a Christian who is not obeying Christ's commands can right, 
can rightly be asked, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and, and do not what I say? Obedience is defined as dutiful or submissive compliance to the commands of one in authority. Using this definition, we see the elements of biblical obedience. It's in the Bible. Old and new. Dutiful means in our obligation to obey God. Just as Jesus fulfilled his duty to the Father by dying on the cross for our sins, submissive indicates that we yield, we yield our wills to God. Commands speaks to the scriptures in which God has clearly delineated his instructions. The one in authority is God himself, whose authority is total and unequivocal for the Christian obedience means complying with everything God has commanded it is our duty to do so well I don't know why they believe you can't lose something I'm telling you I don't I, 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 I. now how is it possible to do this it's because of the Holy Spirit Grace teaches a person to deny all ungodliness and worldly lust and live a righteous life in this present age. Live a righteous life in this present age. Now, how can you be righteous? Striving for having a relationship with God? Remember, you can't do that in sin. You cannot. Don't let anybody fool you. You cannot do it in sin. They're lying to you. Every one of my, I don't care if I'm the only one in the corner against every Christian in the world. I'll tell you, you're all wrong. Every single one of you are all wrong. Every stinking one of you are all wrong. Having said that, it is, it is important to remember that our obedience to God is not solely a matter of duty. We obey him because we love him. Well, he doesn't even give the Holy Spirit to somebody that does not even obey. See, that's what people don't realize. What When it says he gives the Holy Spirit to those that obey, who what, what, what obedience does somebody have to come to an understanding to receive the Holy Spirit? It isn't simply believing the gospel. I'll tell you that for sure. We serve the Lord in humility, singleness of heart, and love. Also, we must beware of using a veneer of obedience to mask a sinful heart. Living the Christian life is not all about rules. Pharisees in Jesus' time relentlessly pursued acts of obedience to the law. Well, actually, I'd be willing to bet that Jesus also had a problem because at the end of the day, it wasn't just, if the Pharisees, if they would have been there when they were going to stone that woman, Jesus could have said the same thing to them and pointed out where they were just in as bad a situation as she was. So, Yeah. Wow. You mean they actually, they're actually made a website that's pretty good. The Pharisees ex external obedience still, I messed up. I'm not even going to worry about it. The Pharisees external obedience still lacks something. And Jesus exposed their heart attitude, their hypocrisy in obeying the letter of the law while violating it. Its spirit characterized their lives, and Jesus rebu rebuked them sharply. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, 
which indeed appear beautiful outside, but inside they are full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Because at the end of the day, this truly, whatever they were doing, was not what God actually wanted. And I'm sure that the persona and the message that Jesus was giving was changing people's lives out here to not be that same person. And in return, what we're supposed to be incorporating from the Bible is to change our life where we're not the same person. Even so, you also appear righteous to men outwardly, but inside you are full of hypocr hypocrisy and iniquity, sin. So I'm, I'm sure back at the end of the day, all this is pointing back when God really didn't care about the law. I mean, he was trying to get some kind of obedience message through their thick skulls, like today through their thick skulls. The Pharisees were obedient in some respects, but they neglected the wit, the W E I G H T I E R with your matters of the law. Today, we are not called to obey the law of Moses that has been fulfilled in Christ. We are to obey the laws of Christ. Yeah. Which is the law of love. Jesus stated the greatest commandments of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and mind. This is the great and the greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law of the prophets is hung on those two commandments. If we love God, we will obey him. Absolutely. Well, what do you think that it's talking about in the Bible to obey? Well, you'll have to look from the front of the Bible to the back of the Bible. We won't be perfect in our obedience, but our desire to submit to the Lord and display good works. When we love God and obey him, we naturally love for one another. Obedience to God's commands will make us light and salt in the dark and the tasteless world. Very good, got questions. Very good. Oh my goodness. They finally made a good article. Like I said, there's all kinds of people out here that can write about something and be correct. But when you write about other things, you won't even be close. Now we're going to see what this website says, which I'm not so sure if I'm even going to like this site. I think I may have read this. You know, I read this. I read this article right here. John 3.36 He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So what about the obedience to, what about the obedience to Christ? Believe me. There's a bigger message in the Bible being preached than what this wicked church out here is preaching. So John 3.36 is not saying uh, what it says earlier on about those that believe not. But remember, an unbeliever is a disobedient person. So... If God tells me not to do something and I do it and I'm disobedient, that makes me an unbeliever. That makes me faithless. 
what is not of faith is sin, correct? Yeah. Why the use of obey rather than believe in the second half of the sentence? It is kind of weird because there's another scripture where it's the same scripture, but instead it uses the word believe. Before John 3, 36, there's, I can, I can look it up. I can look it up. There's another scripture that says basically the same thing, but the difference is it doesn't use the word obey. It says, why use the word obey here rather than believe in the second half of the sentence? The initial assumption is the opposite of belief is unbelief, but John uses the word obey instead. But, but what it's saying is not to be an unbeliever which is what an unbelief is, which is a disobedient person. Because the word there is obey. It says, but he who does not obey, what if you didn't obey, what would you be? An unbeliever. You think I didn't find more proof in the Bible? You think I didn't find more proof in the Bible? Go to Romans 11, 11 and keep on reading down. It uses the word unbelief very toward the very end. It uses the word disobeyed. It, if it is possible to believe in Jesus yet disobey him, how should we interpret this part of the verse that says God's wrath will abide on us if we disobey Jesus? Like I said, there's a bigger message. And since Jesus is the word made flesh and we're supposed to be relying on the word, I can see how we would be disobeying Jesus if we weren't partaking in his word. Does not obey translate for the word which alpha blah, 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 blah. I am not reading that. Thus, the idea of a person not obeying is that they are not persuaded or convinced. The idea of believe here is to be convinced or persuaded to the point of obedience. So what about if we go to the word believe in, uh, in uh, the gospel, what Paul said? Thus, the idea of the person not believing is they are not persuaded or convinced. Does that mean that they wouldn't be convinced in the death, burial, and resurrection? How can you believe in vain? Is there something people are missing when they, when, when they, when they read where Paul says that this is where you've been saved? It's a bigger message there. The two verbs used in John 3.36 display some important information. Trust, have faith in, entrust with, believe in, etc. The other word is disobey, rebel, disloyal, etc. The whole point of this verse is among other things. To trust the Son is to obey the Son. And not to trust the Son is to disobey the Son. Compare this to what to that in Romans 1 5. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. He that obeyeth not the Son, the word which occurs only here in, in the gospel is not the same as that at the beginning of the verse and shows that the faith there intended is the subjection of the will to the son to whom the father hath given all things. This will be an unpopular answer. Suppose we consider the person who, by all accounts, professes faith in God. They are convinced that they are, 
they are in right relation to him that they have done all that is necessary to achieve everlasting life they have been convinced that all they must do is believe in God with all their heart grace through faith belief alone and recite a sinner's prayer something along the sinner's lines the unrespecting believer has been assured that they have accomplished all that God has asked despite the fact that the Bible nowhere states that a person is either saved by faith alone or by a sinner's prayer in reality those who teach such things are rejecting the truth of the gospel isn't that strange isn't that strange with all these people out here saying faith alone? There's only one place faith alone is in the Bible, and it says it's not faith alone. And like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't do no good to preach Christ alone afterwards. Faith alone through Christ alone, that doesn't do no good because it's not faith alone. So why bring up Jesus? It says right here, <clears throat> I'm going to read it again. The unsuspecting believer has been assured that they have accomplished all that God has asked, despite the fact that the Bible nowhere states that a person is saved either by faith alone or by a sinner's prayer. In reality, those who teach such things are rejecting the truth of the gospel. Instead, substituting their own version of salvation irrespective of the sincerity with which the they deliver the message that seems to be what is happening here with John 336 now look at this and I already knew this the King James is a terrible rendering of what constitutes true belief faithful obedience take a look at the new American Standard Bible John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God upon him. Now, remember, I've already read this before, but it's important to hear this stuff because if you can see the layout of how believe and obedience and faith are tied together one way or another, there's no use in talking against works. Because even if works is what obedience is, even if repentance is what works is, at the end of the day, without works, your faith is dead. And technically, you can't even declare that this comes after faith. Actually, it's going to, whatever happens, it's going to happen because the grace of God has allowed someone, the mercy of God has allowed somebody to even be saved in the first place. So if there's any kind of motive behind something that happens after salvation, it's going to come from the grace of God, which is what saves and after. But don't, I mean, because, but don't you think, don't you realize that when I change my mind to, to live a, li a different life through repentance, that God can give grace to the point where your life can change? That's how it's supposed to be. But why accredit it to faith? Because without works, that faith is no good. See? I mean, I know this is making sense. But that repentance has to happen at the beginning of your walk. You're totally mistaken if you think that repentance is something that happens at a later point in time. Because if God knows the intent of your heart and mind is not to change, you're not going to be saved in the beginning. The conscientious believer has bought into false teaching. Believe and you are saved. It is false. And just in case, make sure to recite a sinner's prayer. The problem is that no one can enter into the kingdom of God unless they are born again through water. Well, no, 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 no,
you know, I've stopped right there. Because what this is, this, I, I mean, I'm going to tell you this right now. I have talked against water baptism only for salvation. There's already a scripture in the Bible that proves water baptism is not needed for salvation. I'm not one out here that talks against water baptism no more than am I somebody out here that talks against the Sabbath. The only reason why I talk against the Sabbath is people out here condemning people to hell for not keeping the Sabbath because they're only they're only a fool to their own folly themselves, I think. Because uh, it's a shame when it's not needed for salvation either. But the problem is that no one can enter the kingdom unless they are born again through water baptism. That's not proof. That's not proof. I got baptized by the Holy Spirit. Did I get dunked in water? No. And there's no sinner prayer found in the Bible. But by the way, let me tell you this right now. Again, this is what's going to make a difference at the beginning is your intent. If I say a prayer, ask God to change my heart, and I have the intent to be a new creation, it'll work. It will work. Here is what is meant by belief, adherence to what has been communicated. The letter of James seals the matter with the following two pronoun pronoun pro pronouncements. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. You see that man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Oh, I realize this. Here is what is meant by belief, adherence to what has been communicated. That's right. It's a bigger message. The letter of James seals the matter. What can we learn? James has told us that one, even demons believe in God. He then further elaborates that the, the faithful of God are, God are justified by works and not by faith alone. That is only instance of faith or belief alone in the Bible. Perhaps we should ask these questions. Could Noah have survived the flood if he had not obeyed God and built the ark? Let me ask you this. Was there proof that he ever got water baptized? Oh, my goodness. Was there proof Noah ever got water baptized? I already gave the answer a minute ago. It's obedience and repentance. Because if you're doing those things right there, you'll allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. You'll allow God to have a relationship. The website said it. I didn't say it, but I know it's true. I shouldn't have said I did, but the, the this website said it. The other website said it, and I know it's true. Perhaps we ask these questions. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Could Noah have survived the flood if he had not obeyed God and built the ark? Or could the Israelites have been saved from the Pharaoh by belief alone? Or rather, did they not have to leave Egypt as God instructed though through Moses? Proper belief, in proper belief encompasses action. What is missing while trying to divide the word faith in John 3.36? While dismissing the word dismissing the word obey is the significance of belief in its spiritual definition. Some will adamantly object to this. Obedience is unnecessary because it is a work. They're out there somewhere. We are saved by faith alone. That claim is absolutely false. Why? Because faith is God itself at work. Oh, you know what? 
isn't that weird in the past i've heard people actually give credit to god for faith i'm going to read it again that claim is absolutely false why because faith in god is itself a work but i but i i said i i read that wrong because faith in god is itself a work you know i've said the same thing about believing when people said repentance was works i said what about believing Huh? You're going to say repentance is works. I'm going to say believing is works. And they said faith is works. If works are unnecessary, then faith is unnecessary. Surely no one believe, really believes we are saved without faith in God. In the Gospel of John, we read, Therefore the Jews said to him, What shall we do? so that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. Christ has just told us that belief is a work. Indeed, faith, repentance, confession, baptism are all works. Many are confusing the works of the law of Moses with the works of law of Christ or the law of liberty which makes certain demands on Christians. We do not live under the law of Moses. The old covenant was nailed to the cross. But this does not excuse us from our obligations to the Son of God. And those include belief, repentance, confession, baptism, and, and sustained life of goodness. Godliness, excuse me. I'm going to say it again. I never got baptized by water. And do I think the reason the reason why I'm against it because I'm going to say it again. Here's my example. I run across you. And I say, "Hey, I give you the lowdown about the gospel." And I'm thinking, "Well, uh would you like to get baptized next weekend? Oh, no, I'm just traveling through town. I'm not going to be around next weekend. Well, what if, he had, what, what if that person never gets baptized? What's that person going to do? Go to hell because they never got baptized? That's right. You couldn't put it off. If your salvation was on the line for, for water baptism, then you couldn't put it off. I don't care if you had to go down to the lake and break the ice. Oh, I forgot. Normally, rivers don't freeze up. So you can always take somebody down to the cold river is this difficult you better believe it is we we allow our pride yeah and our herbis i don't know what herbis is to delude us into believing that much of scripture simply does not apply we have convinced ourselves that we know better that's pride i'm, I'm telling you this right now it's pride Christians that are in sin, it's a pride issue. I've sat here and talked about this for the longest time. We know better. Before I ever read, read, read this website, I already knew what it was. I gave an example of this a long time ago. We, are, uh, we have convinced ourselves that we know better and we have concluded that we were just fine. Besides, we're good people. Besides, obedience is inconvenient. Well, there you go. Why would somebody want to take out some inconvenient time to actually serve the Lord? Consider what his God has to say about such sentiments. There is a way which seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. 
You think that that shouldn't have been a wake up call in, in society? There is a way which seems right to men, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs. The death mentioned here is eternal separation. The believer is convinced that their friends would never deceive them about something so serious. After all, one's eternal destiny is at stake. But one's own pride won't allow them to admit they might be led astray. I think I'm going to light me up a cigarette after reading that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to rewrite, reread it again. But one's pride won't allow them to admit they may, they might be led astray. I would know right away if somebody lied to me. I'm not fooled so easily. Well, just who do you suppose are the false teachers in Matthew seven? Those who come to to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are raven, ravenous wolves, leading people astray. Often false teachers are themselves blinded. You know, that's so crazy that I've read that. You know, I may have read this site before. If I didn't, it was something that looked identical to this. I think I did read this one, but I read the other day where when somebody is out here deceiving someone, a lot of times they don't even know themselves that they are deceived. Often false teachers are themselves blinded. They have allowed this because they refuse to accept some very clear scriptural mandates, and it's called the truth. In doing so, they are prop propagating Bible dis disinformation that will mislead many. Society today. Here is a foundational belief only question. Can the new believer ever point out a single moment where they obeyed the gospel. Just how just how did they become a child of God in the first place? It begins to look very much as though this person may fall into and out of Christ at the drop of a hat. And I think there's a reason why. First off, until you receive the Holy Spirit, nobody is saved. No one has Jesus Christ as their shed blood covering until they receive the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 9. No Holy Spirit not of His. Can the new believer ever point to a single moment where they obeyed the gospel? Just how did they become a child of God in the first place? It begins to look very much as though this person may fall into and out of Christ at the drop of a hat. They asked God for the forgiveness, but they were never, ever willing to obey God's willing, willing, willing to obey God's word as a necessary condition for salvation. Living according to the word of God. Of course, the one person they may have obeyed was their friend rather than God. I'm not joking. This is a slap in the face to Christianity right here. Par Parasing John 3.36 and many other passages to read believe as a perilous er errand. The fleeting believer is convinced that they are a child of God. 
but they have done nothing to become a child of God through water baptism and obedience to Christ. Again, water baptism is not needed for salvation because if it was and you were going to give your life to Christ, we would directly go down to the biggest part of, I mean, the, the quickest thing of water to get you baptized if it was needed for salvation. Does that make sense? And you know what's funny is I said this like a year or two ago and Dr. Brown said it in one of his videos the other day. And I'm not lying. I can find the video right now. They don't demonstrate their faith because they regularly forsake the assembly. Well, again, in today's society, if I told somebody about the gospel and they and and I asked them if they wanted to give their life to Christ, I would tell them to pick up the Bible and I'd start telling them to read from the book of Proverbs and I would start trying to get some wisdom from God before I would ever tell them to go to any stupid church out here to listen to anybody out here lead somebody astray by the masses like they're doing. Forsake the assembly. What the hell does that have anything to do with at the end of the day? I know it means something because it's in the Bible. But at the end of the day, if all somebody's going to do is go out here and listen to somebody. What if I told somebody the truth and after they heard what I had to say, that they went into a church and they heard everybody else say something different. And then they heard they got on the World Wide Web and they heard everybody else say something different. Then they got out there on the and uh, and, uh They could easily reject the word of God and reject the truth. They have chosen to refuse worship to God, something that is absolutely crucial according to both the Old and New Testaments. I'm not telling you, I'm going to tell you this right now. If there was not a church in America or in the world that was preaching the truth, you do not have to have anything to do with any damn church out here. I don't care what anybody says. I guarantee you that if I sit here and told you I would not go to church, I'd read the Bible, ask God for wisdom, try to get some understanding. And then if you want to go to church, go to church. Why would I tell you to go to church, be deceived and be like everybody else out here? And put your life, put your salvation at risk listening to other people being dece deceiving someone. I don't think so. In what sense, then, is this person saved? God tells us that we must be washed in the blood of the Lamb. When was this person ever washed at all? See, here we're coming, here we're... Okay, so if the Catholic Church has these things that is supposedly the blood of Jesus and blah, blah, blah. Well, we know it's not the blood of Jesus. So uh, what am I trying to do? What am I trying to get here? So you're telling people that it's the, the washing of being baptized. That's not why your sins go into remission. There's plenty of scriptures out there that print, that prove that repentance is a bigger factor of salvation than water baptism ever thought about being. Because if you don't repent and you go down and get water baptized, what's it going to do? Nothing. Repentance unto salvation. Repentance is a bigger thing of salvation than water baptism is. But then again, are you a church of God? You know, again, I witnessed that one guy had some of the most beautiful messages. Church of God, what does he preach? You have to be water baptized. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, 
We may have to go down to the sewer dump, but you're going to get baptized today. I promise you that right now. I mean, if we can't find no body of water, we can find a sewage dump. I'll tell you this right now. You're going to get baptized today. If your salvation is dependent on water baptism, your ass is getting baptized today. If I was going to waste my time and talk to people about Jesus Christ, I'll tell you that right now. We sure the we sure the hell I about said the F word. We sure the hell ain't waiting till next Sam Saturday or Sunday to decide to go do something so you can get water baptized if your salvation was on the line. That's got to be the most ignorant thing I've ever heard in my entire life. It does not even make sense. If a pa if a pastor knew that you had to be water baptized and and then talk to you about salvation and didn't water baptize you before the day is up that he doesn't deserve to be out here preaching about God if he believes that you have to be water baptized to be saved then he isn't doing his job to get you down to the sewage dump and getting you dunked I'll be damned if I if I believed that you had to be water baptized for salvation you'd be down at the sewage dump before the night is up I hope you can crack a smile. Oh, you mean you're supposed to be washing? You're supposed to be getting clean. Okay, okay, okay. My bad, my bad. Be darned if we're waiting till tomorrow. I'm going to tell you that right now. And I ain't going to wait till your family comes around. It's going to be tomorrow or nothing. It's going to be today or nothing. I say tomorrow. It's not making sense. I mean, I believe I. in the Bible that I have, in the Bible I have, it says water baptism and then there's another baptism. But I'm going to tell you this. I've already seen the scripture that proves that water baptism is not needed, needed for salvation. As a matter of fact, how about this? Does anybody remember that scripture in the book of Acts that says, if you believe that your sins can go into remission? The sins going into remission means that you're, that Jesus has covered you with his blood. You can get the same thing from repentance. But like I said, if I was talking to you and I believed you had to be water baptized to be saved, you ain't making it to tomorrow because it's going to be done tonight. I'll tell you that right now. I'm not going to sit here and, may, and, and have no thoughts of there's a possibility that you won't make it into the kingdom that we have to wait till next Saturday or Sunday or some day that, that, you know, in the future. That don't make no sense whatsoever. And let's not talk about, let's not talk about, well, God knows the intent. No, 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 no. If it's needed for salvation, it's going to be done tonight. Which tonight is actually 1230 in the morning. I'm, uh, uh, I'm in Indiana, Illinois right now. I'm telling you, do I believe that people should get water baptized? I absolutely do. I absolutely do. But all these water baptisms all over America and all over the world isn't going to amount to a hill of beans if people did not repent. If they did not repent, that water baptism did nothing whatsoever. And by the way, I want you, I'm gonna, you want me to tell you how I can prove it to you? So Jesus said repent and be baptized, didn't he? So, this example that this website just gave, which I just fell out of love with, everything up until then was true. Okay, so, to be born of water and have the Holy Spirit. Why bring up repentance then? We'll go baptize you. And you'll receive the Holy Spirit, but you don't have to repent. 
See, there's no logic there. There's no logic. I mean, I, I already know this website's not going to say you that you can't, you have to repent. I realize that. Hey, if you put it off a day, then evidently you don't make it into the kingdom if you believe in getting baptized for salvation. There's got to be a sewage dump somewhere out there. I'm not joking, man. I, I it, it, it doesn't, it, there's no logic behind it. There's no logic. R, A. Now, ask me this question. Ask me this question. Jeff, are there scriptures in the Bible that do sound like the water baptism is needed for salvation? Yes, there are. But remember, to be covered under the blood, washed in the blood of the Lamb, remember, you have to come out of the darkness and into the light to be covered under the blood of Christ. So, you can go get water baptized all you want. If you don't come out of the darkness and into the light to turn from the powers of Satan to the ways of God, you can't be ba you can't be covered under the blood of Christ. When was this person ever washed at all? What does God have to say about sinner's prayer? There is no such thing. Like I said, you can pray anything. I can sit here and pray, God, I'm going to kill myself. If you don't show something about you to me, and, and how many people have done that? And they've witnessed things from God. Absolutely have. And they changed their life. Their whole life changed. As we see here, they feel... Um, there is no such thing since that may have been what they were told rather convincingly. As we see here with John 3, 36, they feel it must be true. Are they really willing to bet their eternal fate on what someone told them? Well, there are people out here that are mad about the Trinity. Again, it's not Trinity. But I'm not going to tell you you're going to hell for believing in Trinity. If it was Trinity, then there would be multiple gods. But there's no multiple gods. There's one God that's inseparable. The Holy Spirit is inseparable from Christ, just like the Holy Spirit is inseparable from God, just like Jesus is inseparable from God, and God is inseparable from Jesus. There is no three gods. There's one God, like the Bible says. There's no three in one. There's one, and they're inseparable. There's nothing you can do about it. Just like Jesus raised himself, just like the Holy Spirit raised Jesus, just like God raised Jesus. That's right. There are no three. Take the picture out of your head. There is no three. There's one. Now I understand. Now I understand why God put it on to me. And yet, there are people out here literally debating people. And they're actually true about a certain motive. Except when it comes to Trinity. It is not Trinity. It's not biblical. At all. Even where it says... Three of uh, where it says bear witness. That, that, uh, they're inseparable. Rather than the alter, unalterable words of Holy Scripture, had they so little, little faith in God's word that they are willing to sacrifice everything by ignoring what they are commanded to do. Like I said, do I believe there is something you gain from water baptizing? I absolutely do. 
but I'm not going to sit here and tell someone that you can, that you can ask Christ into your life to change your heart, whatever little narrative that I want to give to somebody, but say, you're not going to be saved until you get water baptized. So tonight we're going down to the local lake. We're going to break the ice. You're going to jump in and you don't need people to witness it. All you need is God and me. I, you don't even need me. But I guess if you really think that somebody has to dunk you or something. I'm telling you right now, it's got to be the most ignorant thing because the intent of your heart that God's willing to change somebody is what it takes to receive the Holy Spirit. I wasn't wrong. Humble yourself, surrender your life, and be willing to be led by the Holy Spirit. Willing to be led by the Holy Spirit is what takes you out of the law. If you're not willing to allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, you cannot be taken out of the law because it, that's what takes you out of the law is being led by the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit is what changes you. Being led by the Spirit is how you get grace where you can overcome. You don't need to, you don't need to be water baptized for that. But I'll tell you right now, you got to be in a better situation than I am in. Tell you that right now. While many seem to believe that it's that it is perfectly reasonable to dismiss dismiss what God has communicated, there are plenty of examples.